Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our first uh, all-college forum uh, for, for the academic year. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, I'm Bob Deegan. I'm the interim uh, superintendent president. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. And, and today marks almost now two months uh, that, I've, uh, that I've been here and lost just a little more hair and it's a little grayer already, but uh, no, but it's been wonderful. And I want to uh, thank everyone uh, for the wonderful warm welcome that, that I have received uh, over the last, uh, last few weeks. The idea behind the forum is just to provide an update uh, for everybody on a few uh, current topics. So today we're going to uh, address uh, accreditation, budget, enrollment, uh, facilities use, uh, a little bit about campus climate, and then certainly answer any questions that anybody might uh, might have. Uh, for those people who are coming in, there are a couple seats in the back uh, still available. <laughs> you might be able to squeeze in in the middle. Uh, not to worry. Not to worry. Uh, anyway. Anyway, uh, so anyway, to, uh, to begin, I want, we want to talk a little bit about uh, accreditation, and so I, uh, I want to introduce uh, <coughs> Linda Gilstrap and Angie Stewart to talk uh, about accreditation and where things stand. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Angie Stewart. I teach Spanish and ESL. This year I'm serving as your um, AOC co-chair, and this is my trusty colleague, whom I love and present with all the time. I'm Linda Gilstrap, and thank you for that. That was a wonderful introduction. I'm the Dean of Institutional Effectiveness, and I also am the Accreditation Liaison Officer for the college. We're here today to present an overview of uh, where we're at for um, uh, accreditation, and I'm going to give this to Angie. And so if I asked you right now when what our next step was, would you be able to tell me? It's kind of like my class, little crickets, right? This is the problem, and I, I really don't know why, so we really need to start putting some uh, fire under that kettle, because the kettle ain't boiling. We really need to get it boiling. So this is our constituency review calendar. We did October for, um, 1st when um, last month, and so we came around, we, we went to the governing board, we kicked it off with the governing board, went to SEC, went to the Senate, went to go see CSEA, the confidentials, I can't remember, or well, the ASO exec, so we've, we've done a lot of constituency um, sunshine. Is it not working? Yes. Yes, you do. <laughs> so, timeline slide. Oh, yay. So, you can see that our, um, the first read document, we had the, the accreditation working draft, which had a bunch of um, holes in it. We knew it looked like Swiss cheese, but we wanted to show you the process and we wanted to make sure that you knew what we were doing as a um, as a group. So the next Okay, and I just want to make sure that each of you pay attention to the link that's on your handouts. That is the original action letter from our uh, commission, from the ACCJC commission. And uh, that is the one that is our guiding post for as we, as we address the 15, um, um, the 15 uh, recommendations. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that that wasn't lost in, in the presentation. And um, Angie's talking about Swiss cheese, and what she means about Swiss cheese was, the, uh, of course, the working draft. That working draft is now being transformed into um, a first read, into a first read document. And the launch of the first read document is just a few days away. It's October 19th, and um, we will go to... Uh, to, excuse me, we'll go to um, SEC and we'll go to the Academic Senate and um, then we email it out to everyone. Everyone will get a copy of that and then we'll hold forums. Okay. So then between that draft, which is, comes out on the 19th, and then November, the, uh, towards the end of November, 
we really have a big push to do because if we don't get it done, we can't write that it's fully resolved. And I know that I'm preaching to the choir, but we really have to get the message out there to everybody. So um, in January and February, so January and February, we have governing board first and second read, and that will include all the input and feedback that we've received from constituency review. And it's important to note that uh, March, by March 15th, we have to have this report approved and sent to the ACCJC. Then what happens after that, April or May, they come back to our campus. So the visiting team that was here about a year ago comes back to our campus, not all of them, but, but some of them will come back. And then we'll sit down with the follow-up report and we'll walk them through uh, the good work that we've done. I had someone ask me, so when they come back, they're just going to look at our report and make sure that we answer those questions, right? And I said, well, yes and no, because they could come and they could ask us anything about the standards. So we really need to be, all of us need to be accreditation savvy, and we need to be accreditation conscious about what we're doing every day. Everything that we do is part of accreditation. So there are 15 recommendations. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, at the end of June, um, Sometimes at the end of June, at the beginning of July, right on that weekend, they usually give the accreditation status. So they tell you the ACCG, ACCJC meets in June and they discuss, and then um, hopefully they'll come back with some good messages for us. So there are 15 recommendations, as you can see, and um, many of them have been fully resolved with some items that need to happen still. Uh, they're happening this month and next month, and hopefully we're going to have those done. Um, so you can see up here, um, distance ed, compliance, the mission statement, HR evaluations, both the MOU with the um, union, and, and uh, we're suggesting also the um, administrators uh, union because that's it's other people involved in student um, success right, and attainment. Well, I just want to also make this uh, wonderful launch announcement today because in all of your mailboxes you will be receiving the new strategic plan and the new mission statement in a table tent. And so we're asking that um, all of the former uh, strategic plans be replaced by the new one and that the table tent is put in a place that you can refer to it. Uh, but these are compliments of, uh, of Bob Deegan and Andrew Rampt. So that's, uh, that's part of us making sure our, our mission statement is, com is well communicated and hopefully understood and used in every in, in everyday life. So where'd you live, leave off, Angie? Okay. Okay, so what you see in the heading there is um, a term that says 10 deficiencies and five improvement recommendations. It doesn't matter that they're deficiencies or improvement recommendations. We have to resolve all 15. They just put it in uh, those different two different categories, and you can see how they describe that if you uh, access the action letter uh, from the commission. So from recommendation one through uh, recommendation 11 represents the uh, 10 deficiencies, and then the rest of them are the uh, five improvement recommendations. Um, uh, would you like to go through a couple? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, we can count contrary to popular belief, and so it goes one, two, three, four, and then it jumps five. Number five was from the visiting team. Visiting team was really, really hard on our district, and so the accreditation looked at the report and they said, you know what, these people, they have it together, so we're going to give them a chance to really demonstrate what they're doing. So then they wrote this last one, oops, on this side, ACCJC recommendation number one. So it's a slightly um, less work that we have to show, but we still have to meet not, not only 2002, but we really need to show sustainability. In other words, that we're moving in the direction of our next 
um, midterm report, which is just around the corner next summer, and that's the 2014. And if you if you've taken a look at SLOs in any of the standards, and if you if you want them, I can email them out to everybody. But it is woven into everything. It's not just a section or one item. It's everywhere. So we really need to work on this. Okay, thank you. So um, with these recommendations, I just want to point out, because you might be wondering, well, who's working on these? So we've uh, organized work groups per recommendation, and they not only consist of, uh, uh, well, there's a good cross-section. So if there's um, the administrative home of wherever this topic lands, uh, they, they uh, have their leadership um, in, in charge of that, gathering the information and so forth. But then they also went to um, shared governance committees to present the information, get feedback, have input, and so forth. So it, there, there has just been an enormous amount of work done. We have nearly 400 pieces of evidence now, and and some aren't here. Uh, well, we will have over 400 when we get done with our report. We've gotten our possession about 380. Um, but the, the, that little margin that we don't have is really because the semester isn't over with yet, and not all of the um, endeavors are done. And so once they're done, we get evidence that they've been completed. We'll put those in the report as well. Do you want to go to the next one? Um, it's the input and review date. And um, as you can see, here we go, the 19th, the 25th. These are the um, input days. We have a community forum in the evening for those of those faculty and staff that work in the day, they can't get away, and also community members. We really want them to come. Um, we also have then the second read, which is very important, with the academic center. This is when we're hoping to have all of the evidence in line and everything done. It's really a tight timeline. Um, December 14th is going to be the shared consultation second read. And at this point, the um, document will no longer, once it's approved here, it will no longer be changed for the board. And if there's any changes, then we will have to add an addendum or a, a substan another, yeah, another letter explain explaining that. Um, what's the next one? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, oh, I took your, your big one. Okay. Accreditation every day at <laughs> Southwestern for our students and for our, uh, the good of our college. I don't know about you, but I really love this college. I have since I stepped foot on it in 1990. I haven't stopped loving this college, and I really want us to come together. We did it in 2011. We've got to do it again. So I'm really asking, this is a plea. Please come out, help. Do something, help us. Because if we don't do this, if we just stand by, we're going to say, oh my God, the wildfire just went right over us. We've got to do something. So how can you help? Well, make sure that you're connected with the work in your department um, and the leadership in your department um, and ask them questions about, did they participate in any of these work groups? The work groups are listed also on the website. Um, uh, what, what can you do in your everyday life that would be um, supporting accreditation, the changes that accreditation is asking us to make? Here's. Um, Here's really going to be the full circle moment is once we make those changes that they're kept, that we don't just go and we get the good news that we're fully uh, accredited or we're off warning, we get that great news and then we go back to old, um, old ways of doing things. It's kind of like program review, if you remember. Program review many, many years ago was something that you wrote up every three years or every six years. You put it on a shelf and you go, well, I'll look at it again in five years. But that's not the way we work now. The way that we do program reviews now, we look at what we have, we look at what our needs are, we look for the betterment of our students, for our campus, and that's what we do every year. I think we should be looking at accreditation every year because everything that we do, whether it's teaching, administration, helping student services, it doesn't matter what you do on campus, you're helping this institution, and that's what we need. 
So that's what we mean by accreditation every day at SWC. Uh, we distributed those uh, nice little wristbands at opening day. And I'm sure I see all of them. I just don't have my glasses on right now. But, <laughs> but it does remember. Yep, we're, I think we're, we're done. Yeah, we we're going to do questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Linda and, and Angie, for uh, all the work that you're, that you're doing on this very important uh, project. Uh, I also just want to emphasize to, um, to everyone, one of the areas that, that I, I see uh, right now that, that's a, a, a weakness for us is with our SLOs. And I know it's uh, controversial. Uh, it, it, it has been controversial on, on campuses for years and years and years. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we've got to get this uh, got to get this done. I know there's also uh, um, issues and concerns related to um, it being uh, a, a workload and a workload condition, and 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 the uh, faculty union wanting uh, to address this. So I want you to know that the administration is going to meet with the uh, or the negotiating teams are going to meet with this uh, this topic along with uh, other reopeners, uh, and so we're going to address it. Uh, at that level, but I'm also I just want to encourage people uh, to continue to work on, on on this. Even if there's question whether if you have to or you don't, I, for me I'm asking you you know to 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 be involved with this and uh, and to uh, do that uh, that work. Another issue is, was uh, distance education training. And um, the, the administration had identified uh, the end of, uh, you know, prior to the start of spring semester that everyone teaching distance education would have gone through uh, distance ed training. And that was a little controversial, uh, although many, many people did sign up, and I'm most appreciative of that. But, but to, uh, to be accommodating, we uh, moved the, the, the deadline back to fall of, of 17. However, uh, to include this, this, uh, these numbers in our report, uh, I want to encourage faculty who are teaching distance ed to please go through the training. Even if you don't have to go until uh, fall of 17, it would be most helpful uh, if you could complete that uh, prior to us uh, uh, finishing the, the report. So if you could sign up for something this fall, that would be great, or during intercession, that uh, uh, would be uh, most, uh, most appre uh, appreciated. Uh, at this time, we're going to move on to talk a little about budget, uh, an overview of the budget. So I want to uh, introduce Vice President of Business and Financial Affairs, Tim Flood. Well, judging, you know, Bob talked about his hairline a little bit grayer, a little um, less. You can see I've been here just a little bit longer than Bob. But I, I truly appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about our, our budget. Um, it, it's, it's getting complicated. It's a, the way of the state funds uh, community colleges and education in general is really um, a very complicated process. But we'll break it down into some, some simple components for for everybody and then kind of go from there. I'm going to start at the state level and then kind of how that impacts um, Southwestern as we move forward. So the first thing is all our budget goes to meet strategic planning goals. Plan and the budget is based is allocated based on our ability to make strategic planning goals. So planning is driving budget here. So everything when you're looking at student access, student success, workforce facilities, you can take a look at what line items within that budget and see how every one of those line items helps support a student success, student access, and the achievement of student goals. Uh, as far as the governor's budget goes, you know, there, there wasn't a whole lot of new stuff coming to us. So you can say the governor had some, some major priorities that we looked about. So he's talking about 
education was a priority. And so you actually saw, you'll see later on, we got a little bit of extra money uh, and protection there. Infrastructure, the, the roads, bridges, those types of things was another priority with, within the governor's budget. Um, trying to combat the effects of poverty. So a lot of social issues, a lot of money was put in towards, towards social issues within there. Addressing climate change. So you saw a lot of legislation um, come about, about climate change and dollars put into rebates. And we were actually the recipient of that as far as uh, Prop 39 funds go. Um, and then fiscal stability. And this continues to be a, a, a long-term um, goal and subject for the state is we need to prepare for when the next recession comes. And the next recession's coming. All our, our, we're, we're, you know, you're in a cyclical area as far as fiscal goes. So we know that we've been growing for, for the last seven years. And we know that growth pattern is normally five. So we're extended a couple years past the normal growth. And so they're setting money aside for there. And we put $3 billion into the rainy day fund to help by that. So hopefully when, if we start to see a recession, we'll be able to ride that out without huge issues. Um, key components as far as the state goes, you know, we're looking at no loss of apportionment. And I think that was the critical thing. That in December, we lose a portion of Prop 30. We know that the extension of the income tax is on the ballot in November. But the, sun, the sunsetting of the sales tax actually happened in December, but we did not lose a portion from it. The state was able to backfill it through other apportionment, so we did not lose funding for that. We were protected from that. But remember, that was the smallest portion of that Prop 30. The larger portion is the income tax. And we'll see how voters um, react to us allowing the extension of that. Um, we also saw an increase in base allocation. So the state actually said, we're going to give you more money to be able to operate. It wasn't given to us in COLA. It was given to us in base, saying we know that operationally, you're, the, the costs have gone up. And I think this is one way the state's actually trying to direct money to us to help us with the PERS and STRS increases. We know that there's not a, a tremendous amount of public support in having the state allocate funds towards benefit packages that the public sees as as large. Um, so this is a way that we think the state is helping to, to offset those, those costs overall. Also, the state a allocated a 2% growth. So 2% growth, but there's a new um, way that the state divides that growth. So overall, that we're able, this community college would be able to serve about 50,000 additional students. But the way the new allocation is, we have the ability to earn 1.2% growth. Okay, so if we are able to achieve an additional 185 FTES above our base of 15,410, so that takes us to 15,595 would be the new growth. If we're able to do that, we, we have able to garner an additional $916,000 to the district and realize that that money is put into our budget. So, so we, we need to earn it because it's part of our operational budget. Mandated claims. So looking, you know, good news, bad news. We got, this is one-time funds and state allocated one-time funds uh, statewide of $105.5 million. Last year, this year it's 75. So we're getting some, but it's significantly lower. So we went from $8.5 million down to $1 million, uh, 1 1.4 total. So you're seeing a huge decrease from this large. And I'll show you kind of as we talk about it. So we did get mandated funds, one day cost, and that's really repaying us for mandates that the state put forward that they didn't fund us for. So things like bargaining, um, recycling, all those types of things where the state told us we had to do it, but they didn't give us the funds to do it. We kept track of what those costs were. And so if the state was now working to pay us all back for that. And then they also threw in a little bit as far as the property tax backfill. Um, you're saying if, if we ran short at the end of last year, so remember there's deficit factors. Now, last year we had a small deficit factor, which means that the state says, let's say you earn $100, but the state says, yeah, but we're only going to give you $99. Even though we told you we promised you $100, we're only going to give you $99. And I'll talk a little bit about that as, as it goes, what makes that up. But the state actually had a little bit extra money that they were going to backfill any of the shortfalls from last year. And then at P2, which is uh, farther up this year, they'll let us know if there was any leftovers in there, and they will allocate that out as a one-time fund. So we'll see how much that is. Our portion of that, if, if we got it all, would be about $428,000 as a total. 
We have some restricted ongoing funds, too. So we've got basic skills at the state allocated. Uh, community college is a total of 105. Um, it was down, but, but, but the one thing is we, we didn't get that. It was based off of um, applications for, for a special type of transformational programs, and we were not awarded that, so we did not receive those funds. But also know that in, in the following years, they're taking a look at what that allocation process is going to be, and we'll kind of go from there. Um, the other thing is EEO program, just kind of methods, overall community colleges, $2 million of that. We're going to receive $60,000. So we have a little bit of money to, to help uh, implement and continue our EEO program. Uh, Part-time faculty office hours. I'm sorry, I guess I should go for it. Part-time faculty office hours, they increased that, understanding the need for, for fat part-time faculty have office hours. So $3.6 million spread across the state. Now, that's not huge dollars, but there's an application process, so the amount we will get will be dependent upon the number of community colleges that put in for it and how much money they are asking for, and the state just takes it and gives you a prorated amount depending on the applications. CTE Pathways, this is a regional grant, so $48 million statewide. Also, workforce development. So we've got workforce development funds, which is $200 million. And we got 1.4 million of that here at Southwestern. So those are categorical funds that are that are ongoing. Um, Schedule maintenance. We've got um, statewide 184 million. We got 2.4 million of that. So that's going to help fund our instructional materials, instructional equipment, library materials, and scheduled maintenance. And then Prop 39 energy projects to allow us to continue to to develop. Um, uh, sustainability processes here that will allow us to reduce our consumption of, of energy. So a total of $563,000 there. So overall, you're looking at our budget assumptions, you're seeing that you're not seeing a whole lot of additional money there. So we've got $1 million in base allocation. You've got workforce, which is a categorical program to develop workforce. We've got one-time funds from the state of $1.4 million. And then Prop 39 and all the other things overall that you're looking at. So um, the one thing I do want to call out, once again, is the revenue shortfall. And so basically the state's saying you're going to get this much money, but we think that maybe property tax might come in a little bit, and we're not quite sure about enrollment fees, and so we're only going to give you 99.3% of the money we promised you. And so right now that means that's, that's a $616,000 reduction that we have within our, within our allocation. Here's some of the good news. Our ending balance. So we started this last year. We started 15-16 uh, with uh, $8.4 million. We, we, there were reports about our huge structural deficit. I know everybody's heard that, with $5.5 million. So we started to work on reducing expenditures and asked people to stop buying, reduce spent expenses, don't buy anything that's not needed. So instead of going with, with an overall um, deficit, we actually were able to re reduce expenditures. And so you take a look at $99.7 million in revenue, we reduced expenses to 96.7. So we actually were able to increase ending balance instead of ending with a deficit. So ending balance was $11.4 million. The one thing I want to caution everybody is, once again, ending balance is one time, and then a portion of that, the, the board contingency, which is 7%, is housed within that 11%. So total ending balance, here we go. This is what I'm talking about. Total ending balance, 11.4 million. Out of that 11.4 million, 6.7 is our board contingency reserve. So you've got $4.7 million to help us in this current year to for any structural deficits and to help us balance the budget. Based on adopted budget, we needed 2.85 million of that 4.7 to balance the budget based on how our expenditures are calculated right now. So based on what everybody said, here's my budgets, here's what I have to have to operate. We needed 2.85 million above what our revenues were. Uh, FTS and Kathy's really going to hit on this a little bit farther, so I'm just going to kind of breeze through this. This is kind of, remember that last year we were in stability. We weren't going to make our base, and we made the decision, not, not only, if we're not going to make our base, let's take summer and push it into this current year. And so you're seeing the impacts of that where we actually only claimed 13767 to the state because we're pushing summer forward. So this year we're going to need to hit that 13767 um, and then the additional 1643 to hit base. And then we also have the ability 
to hit growth at 185. So if we're hitting that, we're at 15,595. So that's where we are with that. Just want to remind everybody, last year we were in stability, significantly in stability, but that was a strategic decision the college made to help us start stronger this year. Current and prior year, this is, this is the, the bad news. I said there's going to be good news, there's going to be bad news. So you take a look at total revenue this current year, 92.9. Total revenue last year, 99.7 million. So we're receiving this year six, almost $6.8 million less from the state. A lot of that is housed. You know, you take a look. Remember, the one-time funds went from 8.5 to, to 1.4. So, you know, and then you have minor fluctuations within different different accounts as well. But that's a huge difference for us to be able to absorb overall. So what's made, what's it made up of as we kind of go forward? So you've got our principal apportionment that, that we've got, um, and that's made up of our base, which is principal apportionment. We've got Education Protection Act. Remember, $12.6 million of that is from Prop 30, so we need to keep, make sure we're keeping our eye on that. That's a large chunk of dollars that has the opportunity to sunset soon. We've got $25.4 million in property tax. Enrollment fees, 4.1. Full-time hiring, 825. I want to just caution everybody that full-time faculty hiring dollars, those were from prior years. So basically the state gave us two of that last year and said, hire more full-time faculty. It has to be an ongoing line item because once the state gave us that money, told us to hire people for it, they have to keep giving us that money. It wouldn't be, you can't hire faculty on a one-time gig. So that money continues to go there. Uh, federal, so the other sources of regular revenue besides principal apportionment, we've got federal, which is kind of uh, a total of like job development, federal work study, Pell Grant alternatives. You've got other state, which is mainly BOG, lottery, and then mandated costs. That's also where our one-time funds are housed in there. And then local revenue, which is primarily non-resident students. We've got local child care dollars in there too, and then student fees. So as we go through that, total in, total revenue is 92.9, as reported earlier. We had an ending balance total of 11.4, so available funds is 104 million. Now here's our expenditures, and I, I won't to read each one of you. Just as you take a look, you can see their total estimated expenditures, 95.7. Total revenue, 92.9. So we're going to go through there. There's also We've also built in this, as you take a look at vacant salary savings, that's also something that we've, we've that has been a, a process of the college where you've estimated on an annual basis we'll normally have salary savings of about a million dollars. As people go, it takes us time to be able to hire them back. When we do hire them back, they come in at a lower rate. So that's, that's uh, last year, I think it was 1.5. It's down to 1 million this year. So as we take a look at funds available versus expenses, you can see we've got 104 million available, projected expenses 95.7, so net any balance 8.5 million dollars. So remember we were at 11 million, a little over, we we're 11.4. At the end of this year, if we spend the money as everybody has said they're going to spend based on their, their budget allocations, we go down to 8.5. Governing board contingency of 6.7. Net ending balance at the end of this year, 1.8 million. And remember, it took 2.85 million to balance this year. And we know that costs are going to continue to go up. So that, I think that's the, really the word of caution that I just want to talk to everybody. Now, the governor's talking about next budget and watching out for, for the next recession. I'm talking we need to really be conscious about our spending. And truly, we need to continue to reduce. And I'm going to be meeting with people still. I need to reduce our adopted budget by another $1.6 million so that two years from now I can show a balanced budget. Remember, accreditation says they want us to show a multiple, a balanced multiple year budget plan. Right now I can show them a balanced budget. If I reduce $1.6 million, I can show them I can balance this year and I can balance next year. So that's why I must do that. We must earn that $916,000. In, in as far as, as growth goes, it's built into the budget. It's part of our plan overall. And that, that we also just need to keep our eye on the deficit factor. Last year, we started off with a $200,000 deficit factor. It climbed up over a million dollars at P1, and it went back down to zero. So that's one of those things where, you know, as you talk about ending balance and what's going to happen, 
the state is in complete control of that. As, as, as the other thing that we have control of our ending balance and how we spend and what we do would help us allow us to build that ending balance so that we can continue to show that we're moving forward as we work to reduce expenditures to align with revenues. That's what a truly balanced budget is, not relying on ending balance to do it. Ending balance should be uh, relied upon to allow us to do strategic planning initiatives, be able to create new programs and services and give you the time to build those. So really that's what you're looking to do with ending balance. You're really trying to match revenues with expenditures. Stuff on the horizon. As we take a look, we know our health and welfare costs are going to go up 5.3%. About $300,000 is going to is the jump from from last year to this year. OPEB, which is other employee other post employee benefit program. So th those are basically the health and welfare that we're paying for our current retirees. We know that those continue to rise. It's going from 900,000 this year by 2021. It's going to be 1.3. So it's not nearly as much as the PERS and STRS increases. You know, say, oh, it's just 2% a year. Let me show you what 2% a year means. In 15-16, our PERS and STRS costs were 7.3 million. In 2021, our PERS and STRS costs are going to be four, over 14 million. And every year, we're fighting with the state to say, try to give us more money. And, and the first year of increase, they didn't give us an increase. This year, we got a base increase. But depending on what the economy is, we can't assume that the state's going to continue to give us extra money every year to do it. So this is something that we have to, to we have to be careful of and be conscious of. It's it's all of our retirement systems. We want to make sure that it's there, that it's solvent when we're all retiring. And that's what the state's doing. This is a good news that the state's saying, hey, we really need to do something to make sure that the retirement plans are solvent. But here's this is the cost to us, and we have to just realize that that's part of our, our total compensation packages as we as we move forward. So, with that, just like to thank all the departments, the deans, the department chairs, the directors, everybody who helped us with the budget and built their budget, knowing that we were in in kind of dire straits and, and worked to reduce those. Um, and everybody that helped build the budget, and also the finance team, they they, they closed the books a month earlier than normal so we could have some good ending balance numbers to be able to project off of. So they really did a wonderful job in helping us make sure that we've got the best budget that I can present to you at that time we have. So thank you all very much. Great. Thank you, Tim, and thanks for doing a wonderful job with uh, with our, our budget. As you, as you can see, um, We've got to be concerned over the next uh, the next few years and how uh, we can show that we will have an ongoing balanced uh, balanced budget. And so, one of the uh, well, the greatest source of revenue for us is apportionment, uh, right? Which directly connects with our enrollment. And uh, I want to first thank all of the faculty uh, for the outstanding work that you're doing in the in the in the classroom, and then all of the people in student services and all of the uh, the, the staff in support of the work in the in the classroom that we're that we're doing, trying to target uh, student success. <clears throat> because, uh, as I've always said, the best recruiting we can do is to keep the students we have. And I think we're starting to see uh, that turnaround uh, now, and I think we're going to see that continue in, uh, in, the, in the years ahead because of all the investment that we're making and the attention and assistance the students are, are receiving. Uh, but but that needs to that needs to continue, and so we need to you know uh, we need to increase our enrollment, in bringing new students in, keeping the students that we have, and seeing that pie as I say that pie grow. We want that apportionment to grow. That makes it easier to, to have the balanced budget and to be able to afford all the things that we want at the college. Anyway, to talk a little bit about our enrollment uh, is the vice president of academic affairs, Kathy Tyner. Okay, thank you very much. Um, glad to be here to talk about enrollment management a little bit with you. Um, and I hope you all have a copy of the handout. Great. So we will be putting this um, handout on the film for the viewers at home. Uh, but for those of you that are here, if you would um, follow along with me. Uh, first of all, why do we do enrollment management? Uh, well, as Bob uh, mentioned, uh, one of the things, reasons why we do enrollment management is because we want to meet student needs and we want to help them get through their academic pathway 
so that they achieve their academic goal. That's one very important uh, aspect of enrollment management. And as uh, our superintendent president has indicated, we really are grateful to uh, both the deans and the department chairs for helping us with that. But what's another reason for enrollment management? Um, the other reason for enrollment management is because this is how the district uh, brings in revenue uh, from the state. And uh, so I want to take a, just a minute to talk about that without it getting too much in the weeds. So we'll begin with uh, something called full-time equivalent student. We receive revenue called a, or apportionment from the state based on the number of full-time equivalent students that we have in a given semester and then ultimately in a given year. Well, what is that? Well, again, um, there's a formula that's used for calculating that and we take uh, a measure of that at the end of every semester. So I, I have a graph here for you to take a look at. Um, and for those classes that start at the beginning of the semester and end at the end of the semester, we take a snapshot at a, at a period of time called census. So if you take a look at the, at the graph that you can see um, on the handout, um, it shows a line where census is. And that's the snapshot that we take. And on that basis, we send that information into the state and they send us money. They send us about $5,000 for every full-time equivalent student we have, or FTES. Um, and you can see what happens over time. And so the lines that you can look at on this particular graph are, there's a, a blue line, which represents the amount of FTES that we've actually earned. And you can see how it changes over time. So as we go through the registration period, it starts out fairly low and then it increases. And then you can see where census is and then it starts dropping. Okay, and then you can also see uh, something called uh, some, uh, the red line, which is the full-time equivalent max, which is basically the potential FTES that we could get. It's essentially tied to the number of seats that we have available for students to register for. And then you also see a line there that's called uh, productivity, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, and so again, this just gives you an idea of, of what happens, and the census figure uh, that we report to the state is based on the enrollment of the students, and we wait for faculty to turn in the class rosters during that particular week, and once we get them all, then we have our, our figure that we send to the state for those classes that are full term, beginning at the beginning and ending at the end of the term. Um, okay, so let's move on to what are our goals, really. Well, we want to meet student need. We want to help students achieve their academic goals in a timely manner. We also want to generate the revenue that we need to be able to operate. And again, this is how we get, as you saw from uh, VP Flood's presentation, this is how we get the bulk of our revenue. So what do we need to do to do this? Well, before I go through that, let me just say that we had a visit uh, from the IEPI group, uh, which is called the um, Institutional Effectiveness Project Initiative. Did I get that right? Um, partnership? Okay. And... Um, they basically said we need to make sure that we communicate to the campus uh, how we are doing this enrollment management. We all need to be on the same page in terms of the way we work towards achieving these goals. We all need to know what's going on because we all are all basically on the same ship. And so that's one of the attempts of, of this particular presentation is to try and get that message out. So what, what do we need to do? What are our goals for this year? Well, one thing is we need to meet our FTES target, for sure. Uh, and that FTES target is 15,410, as you saw from the presentation previously. We also need to increase our FTES so that we hit the growth target. And that's about 200 FTES more. Uh, and so that's 15,000, let's say 600, roughly. I think I said uh, 15,610. Well, how are we doing that? Well, one of the ways we're doing that is we are um, looking to see what the wait lists look like and adding classes as we need to based on student demand. We've added nine sections, for example, of English 115, uh, which, is, uh, which is the English composition course that students need to graduate. We've added seven math classes based on student demand just this semester based on student demand, as I said before. Um, 
What's another? So we 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 look like it appears that we are on target for meeting our growth, uh, and that's important because our budget is based on that. We've put the growth into our budget this year. Uh, the third thing that we need to do is we need to increase our productivity, and that's a term that I haven't explained before. And productivity has to do with the number of FTEs generated per full-time equivalent faculty. What's interesting is that, and, and a little scary at the same time, is that if we look at that productivity measure last year, it was 14. The goal, the target, what we actually are trying to reach, if you look at the standard accept, accepted uh, value for the state, is 17.5. We were last year at 14, and we need to be at 17.5 for the fiscal health of our district. And we need to figure out together how to do that. And that's really what this, this visiting team told us, is that we all need to be on the same page and understand what we need to do to make this happen. In attempting to turn the ship, which is not an easy thing to do, it appears, based on the preliminary data that we have right now, that we are at 14,000 point, not 14,000, 14.58. So we went from 14 last fall, and now it appears, based on preliminary data, that we're at 14.58. So we are moving in the direction, but we need to do better in terms of achieving that. So um, the, the page that is, uh, the section that is right next to the graph is kind of a summary of where we are right now. Uh, and I won't go through the numbers at this point other than to just point you to the bottom three uh, rows on the bottom table. The bottom three rows on the bottom table says it looks like what we're going to make this year is 16,132 FTES. You all see where I'm at? It's the, it's the bottom table next to the... Um, it's, let, me, let me, I'll tell you right now. If you look just below that, what was the base that we absolutely have to make? The base we absolutely have to make is 15,410. Do you all see that? Okay, and what about, what is it we need for growth? Well, we need 15,600 roughly. So we made it. So we made it. But we always can't be thinking just about this year. We gotta think about next year too. And where are we going to be out for the next year? Okay, because there's a, there's a very good reason why we hit that target. Um, and I'll point that out. If, again, you look at the very bottom table there. Now I'd like you to look at the top line. You see where it says 1,191? Mm -hmm. That number is a number of FTS that we pushed forward from last year. We were in stabilization, as VP Flood indicated, last year. We didn't, hit our, we didn't hit our base, and since we are, we're already not going to hit our base, we pushed all of summer into this year, which you are allowed to do. Okay, so that's how we're hitting this this year, is because we pushed what we earned last year forward. Okay, but that gives us, you know, we can sleep well because we're, we've hit that target for this year, but we need to be looking into the future. Okay, because we want to assure that we're going to be making enough FTS next year and the year after and the year after. So if you, and uh, I'm going to look at my, my boss here to tell me when I'm done. Um, I'm getting close. Okay. So, <laughs> so get the hook or do this or something. Um, so if you turn the page over, and I know that's very small, which is why I didn't put it on the PowerPoint. Um, I did. I wrote some figures on the very bottom of the page because I wanted you to see a trend that, that concerns me. And um, if you start with where I handed it in 2013-14, you can see a number 15,276, and then I subtracted 90 from that. I did that because we had pushed 90 FTES forward from the previous year. I wanted to know what did we actually make in that year. Well, we made 15186 I wrote it there for you. Hopefully I did the math right. Okay, well, let's look at the next year. Um, we, we actually made 15410 but we had pushed forward 300 from the previous year. So what did we really make last year? Oh, in 1415, rather. We made 15109 How does that compare to the previous year? It's down, right? 
Okay, let's go to last year, 15, uh, 2015 to 2016. What did we actually earn last year? What we actually earned was 14957 We had nothing to push forward. So we earned 14957 Well, what does that mean? Well, we went from 15186 to 15109 to now we're at 14957 We're going down. Even though we added, you know, we had the compressed calendar, we had weekend college, we had the two-year schedule. So that's why we all need to figure this out together. We've tried, we, we're all needing to put our, our heads together to figure out what we can do to reverse this trend. So I put on that handwritten thing 1,191, and I have a little circle around it because I wanted to show you that we pushed that into the next year. And so as Tim reported previously, what we actually reported last year, 15-16, was a lot less because we were allowed to do that. So we reported 13,766 last year. And that allowed us to push, and, and we, got paid, we didn't lose any money because the state allows you to do that and you're in something called stabilization. So we got the same money, we didn't get cut. But we have to get back this year. And so we've already established that, yeah, we should be fine this year. We should be getting back this year. Um, we have the 1,191 we said forward. We said, let's just assume we're going to make the same FTS as we did last year, roughly. So that's where we get the 16,132. As we just discovered, if our base plus growth is 15,610, we should have 522 FTS to push forward next year, right? So that's good. That means that in 1718, in, uh, uh, we're going to have 522 in the bank. But what if we still make the same amount of FTS? Well, if we make the same amount of FTS as, we do, as we're thinking we're going to do this year, then we're at 15,460 next year. What's our target? 15,610. Did we hit it? No. So that's why our push this year is to generate as much FTS as we can. The more we push forward, the safer we are in terms of what we do next year. So that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kathy. And, uh, and, and enrollment management is uh, it's very important, and, and it's, it's critical that we have the faculty and uh, department chairs working with the deans uh, and everyone in instruction kind of, kind of pulling together uh, with this. And, and as, as Kathy mentioned, enrollment management, the, all those little formulas that you didn't go into but are, are important for people to know, those are kind of like, the, like math facts. You have to understand those so that you understand how everything else kind of all ties uh, all ties together. And and you see again, we want to build an outstanding uh, schedule and curriculum to meet the needs of our students. That's that's of, of most uh, utmost of importance. But how can we do that and maximize apportionment so that we can generate the the revenue that we need to run the college the way we want to run it? So we'll go from there. One other thing with uh, uh, with scheduling is uh, for the first time in a, uh, quite a few years for the spring we're going to we're going to mail out a, a modified class schedule so it'll be a, a class schedule that'll list all of the courses that are being offered but it won't list uh, days and times so it'll say you know intro to psych uh, developmental psych social psych experimental psych uh, and then everyone will be directed to go online to the online class schedule to uh, to see the specific uh, days and times, it'll highlight all of our centers, each having a nice little quarter page, I think, or half page. Uh, and and my thinking is is that uh, this will prompt people to go online to look at the, the schedule. So for it'll help people who who may be interested in taking a, a class. Oh wait a minute, let me just see. Oh, wait, I wonder if it's offered Tuesday, Thursday. And uh, so I'm hoping to see a little bump uh, in our, our, our enrollment uh, in, uh, in, in the spring. I want to tell you just a, uh, quickly a little bit about, uh, I know you're going to love this, facilities usage. 
right? everybody's favorite topic. And, uh, and I need to bring this to everyone's attention because it's become a problem, uh, a, a, a more serious problem than I, I ever would have imagined. And in my two months here, I think we've dealt with three instances uh, <clears throat> where people have utilized uh, colleges' facilities for uh, their own personal gain in some manner. Uh, <coughs> little businesses or services to, uh, to, to others. And I just want to be very, very clear to everyone that you can't do that at Southwestern College. And if indeed it has been past practice, no one ever told me before that that was a problem, I, I'm telling you, I'm telling everyone, that's a problem. Don't do it. Now, it's not to say it can't be done in some manner, but you have to have a, a facilities use agreement that's approved by the college. And there are fees associated with that for the use of the facility or equipment or whatever we might be, uh, you might be using or a person might be using. <coughs> and we charge for that. And that income goes to the to the college. Now the individual may also receive something, and that you know that can that can be fine. But what's not okay is for people individually to do this and individually come to agreements with people in the community. Because, for example, as one thing uh, that one thing happened, when people are dissatisfied with the service they have received, they think they're dealing with the college when they're really just dealing with an individual. And when they write a letter to the governing board, guess where it goes next? It comes right to Bob. And I'm going, what? They're doing what? Where? No. And then I find out, yes. And so it's no. So, I, you know, so uh, Vice President Flood put out a, uh, a, a memo to everybody outlining uh, the facility's usage and what you need to, to do. And if you're thinking about this, well, this is a good idea. Uh, you, you've got to make sure you go through the facilities office. Get that form filled out. Make sure that that's, uh, that's done before you do any of, uh, of this. And again, uh, people think, oh, uh, you know, it's not a big deal. I'll just uh, make a few copies because I'm having a garage sale or something like that. Right? That's not okay. Don't do that. Go to Kinko's. Uh, for things like that. But just imagine, uh, if you would, and I'm not saying this happens, so I don't want to blame any department, but just imagine that someone decided, well, you know what, hey, a copy machine. I think I'll, uh, I'll open a little shop here, and uh, I'll start making copies for, uh, for, for people, and, you know, 10 cents a piece, and, uh, you know, I'll deliver them in my neighborhood, and, you know, I got a little business going. No! No! You know, no, it's not, it's, it's not okay. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm just advising everybody not to do that. Check the facilities. We're going we're gonna to put out another memo to everyone. And I know everybody's going, are you kidding? Someone's doing that? Yeah. The thing is, yes, someone's doing that. They've been doing that. And, and, and again, this is a, a large college, and we have a lot of centers, and there's a lot of uh, equipment, and there's a lot of uh, facilities uh, that, that, uh, that are used. And, and we want them to use for, for the purpose of serving our students. And if it's the Civic Center Act that, that we're using for, for a partnership with people in the community, fantastic. But not individually. So not for personal, not for your own personal gain. So, uh, so hopefully that's enough said on that topic. And, and the last thing I want to uh, touch base on and, and then uh, we'll, we'll end today is just a little bit about campus climate. And, and first, I want to thank uh, Guadalupe Corona and the Equity, Diversity, and, and Inclusion Committee for their outstanding work that they're doing. Uh, they're, they're off to a, a good start and, and are doing some uh, fine work. I also want to thank uh, uh, Janelle Williams and Professional Development for uh, her speaker series that she's, that she's put on, a lot of professional act, uh, activities. The ASO for the work that, that they're doing. Uh, I think it's, it's helping our, 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 our campus, our campus community, our campus climate. But I want to just, uh, and I put out uh, a, a little note uh, this, this morning that you may have seen about an incident across the street. And, 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 and that is at the 7-Eleven, there's a, a newspaper uh, rack 
that holds our newspapers. And so one of the Sun reporters yesterday went over there and uh, and and saw this uh, uh, racially disparaging remark written with a sharpie over the front page of our of our newspaper. A racist, awful, terrible remark. And uh, a man there, uh, dressed as a you know cons construction worker, uh, probably proclaimed that he had done it, and in fact posed with the newspaper uh, for the Sun reporter. Here, I'm, 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 I'm proud of this. It wasn't like it was even done, you know, under the cloak of night, you know, and where someone ran, ran out. No, this is boldly done, and. And I, I'm an easygoing guy. <laughs> I, I, it takes a lot to make me mad, but I'll tell you, I was just furious uh, when I uh, when I, I heard this. We investigated this. We had our police department there. We contacted the Chula Vista Police Department, and I, I wanted to find out was was this guy one of the people working on our construction site? I wanted you know because if that was the case. I wanted not only to talk to him, I wanted to talk to the president of one of those, whatever company it might have been, because this is not, you know, it was off campus, it was close enough, and it was our newspaper. Uh, but as it turns out, it wasn't. Apparently, the, this, this man got in, into his uh, truck, apparently it was a landscaping truck, and, and drove north on Otai Lakes. So he's head, heading off in a different direction. But I was asking, did anybody get a picture of the truck? Did anybody get to see the name on that, uh, the name of the landscaping company? Because I want to talk to the owner of that company. And, and so if we ever find out, uh, I, I don't know, because I, I want to talk to that person about that employee. And I want to just assure them that if you're ever looking to do business <laughs> with Southwestern College, let me tell you, you're not bringing that guy. And, and I'll tell you, I'm not uh, interested in doing business with anybody that would uh, have an employee like that. Anyway, on and on and on. Uh, so, but what that does is just raise the issue that, uh, that again, thank you, and I'm thinking to myself, uh, if this is uh, on campus, I'm, uh, I'm throwing that person out. <laughs> you know, uh, if it's a student here, discipline, boom, they're gone. I'd throw them out. We'd, we'd, they'd, they'd be suspended. And that, but I'm thinking, that guy, I'm almost hoping he enrolls because he needs to enroll. He, he needs to, you know, he needs to get rid of that ignorance and learn uh, to, to rid himself of that racism, uh, and, and we might be the place that would help him. So I was kind of torn with that. If he was here, I'm throwing him out. And if he's out there, I want him in. <laughs> but but we, we, it, just, it just shows that we, we need to be ever vigilant in, in, in our efforts and to know, and, this is, and, and, and we see it more today than I think we have in years, that uh, racism, sexism, uh, homophobia uh, are alive and well in our society, and 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 it's all of us. This is not a black or brown. It, it's all of us. Uh, it's our issue that that all of us stand and say that this is not going to be tolerated. And wherever we see it, whether it's certainly on our campus, but in our community, that we stand up and say no, uh, not not okay, not tolerant. Just to think that this guy's bold. Oh, this, I'm proud of this. How embarrassed! I want to talk to his mother, <laughs> his father. <laughs> I'm just furious. Anyway, so that's right. Um, anyway, in, in talking about our own campus climate, and I, I think, and I think a lot of the work that's going on is is, is, is great. But when I talk to a lot of people around the, uh, around the campus, one of the things I I think that we need to do more of, and I wanted to. Uh, Point out because Andrew Rent brought this to my attention for you know the the, the first time I heard about it and I since I've heard that I, I hear more and more is we need to celebrate the good work that we're doing at this college we need to celebrate and honor the fine work of individuals the fine work of departments services etc and and here's I, I, just a shining example that uh, after that knucklehead. Uh, across the street uh, did that. On the, on the same day, I'm happy to announce, and you may have seen this uh, on an email, that our newspaper, The Sun, was named the National Collegiate Newspaper of the Year uh, yesterday. So, so congratulations to Max Blanham, 
all the students associated to it, the, the uh, you know the best college newspaper in the country. Thank you very much, and I'm very very uh, proud of that. And so I want to celebrate that. I want to celebrate the work that everybody does. And then and also when I, I think it's important, we need to recognize the work that that people do. The work our classified staff does, the work not only our faculty do, but our part-time faculty, and how hard uh, those people uh, work, uh, and the fine work our administrators do in, in support of, uh, of the students at this college and, 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 and student uh, success. Um, so, and then finally, I think it's, uh, I, I want to promote, and I'll try to do this as long as I'm here, and then certainly talk to the, the permanent uh, superintendent president when, when they come in. It's about opportunity. One of the things I hear from the classified staff is I don't really have as much opportunity as I as I as I I'd, I'd like. There aren't clear pathways for for me. There are programs to help uh, you know promote leadership and mentoring, and and I want to do that because I'm I'm hearing from from uh, Andre about uh, 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 one of our custodians who has an advanced degree. Works the night shift, so I want to talk to him and find out if, if, if that's indeed his goal and that's what he wants to do, or is, is you know, are there opportunity? I, I want to provide that opportunity for everyone who might be here, uh, and and to uh, you know create that kind of you know, mentorships, you know, some type of you know, let's we'll meet you know every couple of weeks or once a month for for lunch and just talk about leadership and what are you doing and what can we do and are you taking classes and have you thought about a degree or you have a degree and you need an advanced degree, whatever it might, whatever it might be. And whether that's a promotion here or, hey, there's a job at City College that, that might be just what you're, you're, you're looking for. Community colleges, if nothing else, our whole system, it's a small world. Uh, and, and those of you who've been in it long enough, you, you, you know that you see people move around and, da, 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 and pretty soon you know, you know people everywhere. And that's, and that's, uh, and that's good. And I also want to uh, uh, promote, or certainly here, or let me promote to the new superintendent to promote, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the importance of developing the talent in-house. <clears throat> so for, and, and by this we can also help our diversity. My hunch is that we, we probably select about 50% of our full-time faculty from our part-time ranks. <clears throat> but what we need, we need to have, and if we're looking to have more diversity in our full-time faculty ranks, then we need more diversity in our part-time ranks. So let's actively recruit and put out programs there, actively uh, be involved with the graduate programs in the, in the area, to be more active with the Sadika Internship Program, which identifies graduate students who are interested in, in teaching at the community college, and they team them up with a faculty member for one semester, and they kind of shadow them, uh, and then the, the college where this is occurring uh, turns them loose and lets them have a class uh, the, uh, the, the second semester, and we pay them. So they, you know, gives them opportunity, uh, <laughs> gives them a chance to see if they, if they like it, have them begin to hone those, those skills, and we can then add some diversity to our part-time part ranks. And the same is true when we think about administration. It's wonderful to bring people in from out. It's, it's good. <laughs> but it's also important to develop uh, our, our, our fine uh, pool of talent here from, uh, from faculty and staff ranks into administrative uh, uh, positions. And so we have to provide mentoring opportunities uh, and for, uh, for, for people and to encourage people to, uh, to apply. Have you ever thought? You know, and, and we laughingly call the administration often the dark side. You know, have you ever thought of going to the dark side? Uh, but let me, and I do I do that all the time myself. <laughs> but but it can be a very rewarding career, and you have an apps you have uh, opportunity to provide in influence. That's the only reason I ever got into administration. This is the best job on the college campus. Sorry, faculty. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. It, it 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 it's the best job on uh, on a college campus. But if, if you want to have some a little more influence sometimes, then you know one thing department chair, then you know sometimes think about dean, 
if you want to continue to think about uh, a vice president, and at each point you get more. It's to, and then to do things to help. And again, it's always to help students. And then sometimes, but with, but with resources and programs. But you can do a, uh, do a lot. And so, I, and I'm I'm glad we just hired Patty. Yay! Congrats, Rick. <laughs> All right, to come into uh, administrative uh, administrative rank, and I said to uh, to the committee, fantastic, you know, she's fantastic, and I'm just telling you, at other colleges, you would, you know, you'd be you would be doing flips if you could get someone as qualified as her to come into that uh, into that position, and so lucky it's here, you know, she's she's here, and so let's develop that pool of talent because we weren't and didn't find anybody anywhere else that was going to be better than the than the person that we had right here, and uh, so I'm I'm thrilled, but we need to do more of that, and it's kind of a combination of of that, and I think all of those things together help help this campus climate, and again I'm here two months. Um, but this is a wonderful college. It's a very good place, and people really care uh, about about students. And so I want people to, you know, again, you know, you, you know to thank the custodian for the work that they that they uh, that they do. As, and I I go and I talk to them at the beginning of the, of the semester because I know if they're not doing their job, I can tell you it's like the, like going to the board. Right? I get the complaints, you know. Classrooms aren't clean, you know, the bathrooms are dirty, what, what's wrong, what, 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 you know. And so when those guys uh, are doing their job, it helps, it helps us all. And that's in every department uh, that, we, uh, that, that, we, that we do. So, so, you know, reach out, just, you know, thank the people, the pe all the staff that work in the, in the offices and, and all the offices and things that they, uh, that they do and make their, uh, you know, just that, that uh, just acknowledgement. That you recognize that you know I, I work hard because they, uh, they 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 do and then you know what people work harder <clears throat> they they want to do it because it's good for the good, it's good for the college so anyway we'll we'll continue with all all of uh, of these things there's lots of things uh, going I'm going to talk to uh, to Trenda and the and the, and the VPs to about the you know, ideas about uh, about diversity and um, and with the uh, with the part timers. And what we and what we uh, can do as a as a start, we're already you know more acknowledgement of of uh, people in each of the segments, whether it be classified staff, faculty, or or uh, or, or admin administration, and but uh, and then long term, you know those opportunities, whether it be uh, mentorship, leadership programs, etc. I just think it would go a long way here uh, that people have not that you have to do it, but if you might want to do it. And, and just, you know, let me go in and, and see. I mean, the last thing I ever thought was that I was really that I was going to be a, an administrator. I, I was going to be a happy counselor for years to come and, and probably would have been. But, uh, you know, I, I did an interim assignment. And, uh, and then, you know, who knows what happens. And, and, and it went from there. Anyway, so anyway, to all of you that are here, uh, you know, thank you very much for, for taking time out of your busy, you know, lunch hour or college hour. We really uh, appreciate it. And we'll try to have another one of these uh, before the uh, end of the of semester on topics that, that may be of, uh, of interest and things that are, that are going on. I want to thank all the people who presented today. They did a, a, great, a great job. And everybody, thank you for being here and, and, and taking time. Anyway, and thanks for your support of Southwestern College. Thank <laughs> you.